Athens. Good morning. Good to have you with us. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. We're going to get started this morning with the latest in Texas. So the battle continues over that controversial immigration law, SB4. Today, the law remains on ice while a federal appeals court decides the case. Yesterday, judges with the Fifth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals held an hour-long hearing at issue Texas's attempt to arrest and deport people who illegally enter the country. Now, that hearing is part of a legal ping-pong game between the Supreme Court and the Federal Appeals Court. The law was initially put on hold by the Supreme Court. Then justices allowed it to take effect, only to see the law blocked again hours later by the Appeals Court. Here's the issue at the center of it all. Texas officials want to take immigration control into their own hands with Senate Bill 4 after seeing a spike in illegal border crossings. It would give state authorities the power to arrest and deport migrants, even though historically overseeing immigration in the border those have always been under the federal government's control. Now it's a wait and see. The law will remain frozen at least until next month when the Fifth Circuit has scheduled more oral arguments to consider whether the law is constitutional. NBC News correspondent David Noriega is on the border in Eagle Pass, Texas with the latest. So, David, both the Justice Department and the Texas Solicitor General made their arguments in front of the judges on the Fifth Circuit yesterday. What did we hear? Yeah, guys, good morning. So what's at issue right now is whether this law will be allowed to go into effect while the constitutional challenge against it works its way through the courts. On the one hand, you have the federal government saying that this law, all of this law inherently is unconstitutional because it infringes on the federal government's sole authority to enforce immigration law. Texas says that the law, uh, it mirrors existing federal immigration law and doesn't contradict or get in the way of it in any way at all. Uh, you know, th that's what's at issue here is whether the law will be allowed to, to, to be in place, even just temporarily, while the constitutional challenge moves forward. Yesterday's hearing, I would say the judges were pretty split. So right now, really, it's a coin toss on whether we will actually see people arrested under this law in the weeks or months to come. So one of the major issues here is how Texas would implement this law if it were to go into effect, because the state is already thin on resources, right, to handle this influx of illegal migrant crossings. And then there's questions over how the proposed deportations would even be carried out. Uh, what is being said about that? What did the Texas Solicitor General say specifically on that matter? As far as the, the attorney representing Texas in the hearing yesterday, this is actually one of the things that really jumped out at me the most about the hearing is that the, 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 the attorney was asked on multiple occasions to give specific sort of illustrations of how this law would be uh, carried out, how it would be implemented in concrete terms, and he was not able to. He, he repeatedly admitted that he did not know what this would look like, including in that really, really key provision that you mentioned, the deportations. One of the most unprecedented aspects of this law is that it would give uh, state authorities the power to remove immigrants back to Mexico. It has never been that way before. The federal government has always carried out deportations for a lot of reasons, because deportations require binational agreements, for example, between the United States and the country receiving the migrants. In this case, Mexico came out, Mexican officials, right up to the president, came out very soon after the law was allowed to go into effect uh, for just a few hours, saying that they would absolutely, under no circumstances, receive anybody deported under this law. Th th this law, uh, it's uncharted territory in a lot of respects. That question about the deportations is by far the most uncertain. Back to you. David, what is next in this case? I'm guessing when the circuit court does issue its ruling, there's a good chance this will make its way back to the Supreme Court? Yeah, I think it's all but certain that whoever the losing party is at the Fifth Circuit will appeal it up to the Supreme Court. The question is whether the Supreme Court will agree to review it. I think it's likely that it will, given the really high degree of importance and urgency of this case. Uh, you know, the constitutional legal experts that I've consulted on this say that there's pretty strong precedent supporting the federal government's case, including, uh, as you're, you know, probably the most famous case is Arizona's Show Me Your Papers law from back in 2010, where the Supreme Court ruled that Arizona could not pass a law similar to this one because it violated the Constitution. But, you know, we're in a pretty uncertain time now, especially with this, uh, you know, relatively new conservative supermajority on the court. And I, I don't think that we should be making any clear predictions about where this will land one way or another. Back to you. David Noriega reporting from Texas. David, thank you. And while many big cities are feeling the strain of the growing number of migrants in the U.S., some smaller towns are divided over whether to welcome them as they look to fill thousands of jobs. NBC News Homeland Security correspondent Julia Ainsley has more. In major cities across America, officials say they've reached a breaking point struggling to handle the record number of arriving migrants. 
But here in small town Fremont, Nebraska, where there are just 39 workers for every 100 job openings, some are encouraging even more legal migrants to come. We need these people. We need this work done. This is what feeds the feeds the nation and the world. Many of the openings are at this half billion dollar chicken plant opened in 2019. Young locals often move away, leaving those slaughterhouse jobs to migrants like Vicente Hernandez. With Hispanic migrants, although it is hard, although it is heavy, they endure, he says. The difference with an American citizen is that every time he finds a job, when he sees it is hard, he leaves it, he says. Hernandez and his wife are also pastors to the growing Guatemalan community. Once this town of 27,000 was nearly all white. Now, one out of six are Latino. Since 2018, the school district added almost 800 non-English speaking students. Meatpacking is the biggest industry here in Fremont. The state's Chamber of Commerce says Nebraska needs to welcome more migrants to fill jobs like these. But some residents here are resistant to that change. Voters backed a town ordinance twice, which says locals must tell the city that they are here legally before they can rent housing. The city cannot always verify the information, but people say the law remains on the books to send a message. Councilman Paul Van Baren supports it. Why was it brought up? Citizens had asked the city council to do something because it was pretty obvious that we were become a haven for illegals. He argues slaughterhouses paying low wages to migrants lowers incomes for citizens and criticizes increased costs for migrant children at local schools. The sheer pressure of bringing in numbers of people has resulted in a considerable burden to the taxpayers. But City Councilman Mark Jensen, who's lived in the area since he was 10 years old, is against that ordinance. It's a bad look for our city. And he says Fremont needs to embrace change. Immigration is crucial. A lot of people that live and grew up here don't stay. They, they, they move out. It's critical for us to... Uh, to have the, the people that we've got here. Back at the church, Vicente tells us he regularly gets about three hours of sleep a night. But still, he and his wife Maria say they found their new hometown. Now I live the American dream, as they call it. I'm happy because I have everything, she tells us. State officials say they often have problems with undocumented workers using fake IDs. Just this month, four migrants were charged with using them to get slaughterhouse jobs. Julia Ainsley, thank you. Lev Parnas, a former associate of Rudy Giuliani, came out swinging yesterday during a hearing on Capitol Hill, part of the Biden impeachment inquiry. He gave statements that the allegations against the Biden family are false. After testifying before the House Oversight Committee, Parnas told NBC News that the hearings are pushing Russian propaganda. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ryan Noble says more. A fiery inflection point in the impeachment inquiry into President Joe Biden. Excuse me, sir. Excuse me, sir. This is Mr. Bobulinski. This is my time. House Republicans holding a hearing designed to feature Hunter Biden, who had asked to give public testimony, but declined to appear. Instead, the committee heard from a pair of former Hunter Biden business associates who testified, despite President Biden's denials, he was involved in his son's businesses. He was an active, aware enabler who met with business associates such as myself to further the business. They say Joe Biden participated in person and on speakerphone in meetings and dinners with Hunter's foreign business partners. Hunter's former business associate, Jason Galanis, testifying from prison. The vice president said hello, some pleasantries, and then hope you had safe travels, and then said, quote, okay, be, you be good to my boy. But Democrats firing back, saying there was no evidence of a crime. With any luck, today marks the end of perhaps the most spectacular failure in the history of congressional investigations, the effort to find a high crime or misdemeanor committed by Joe Biden and then to impeach him for it. Democrats invited Lev Parnas, a one-time associate of former President Trump's attorney, Rudy Giuliani, who testified that he was tasked with digging up dirt on Biden business ventures in Ukraine. I found precisely zero evidence of the Biden's corruption in Ukraine. In an exclusive interview, Parnas accused Republicans of being willing accomplices of the Kremlin. They're not getting down to the truth. All they're doing is pushing the same Russian narrative and propaganda. And tonight, the Oversight Committee Chairman James Comer saying he will invite President Biden to testify at an upcoming hearing. Our thanks to Ryan Noble for that report. We'll hear for more on this is NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos. Danny, good morning. So how significant is this to have Lev Parnas come out and speak against former President Trump and Rudy Giuliani in this way?
It's significant, but there's going to be something for everybody with Lev Parnas's testimony because he's a kind of cooperator with the same baggage that you might see in, say, a Michael Cohen, somebody who was very loyal to people like Giuliani in the case of Lev Parnas, and uh, now has totally turned against him. And whenever you have someone like that with a cooperator type character, uh, you can make the point that, well, they were so sure of what they were telling you before, and now they're saying, oh, I've seen the light. You know, were you lying then or are you lying now? But all in all, the Lev Parnas testimony was a big dud for Republicans. It didn't deliver what they wanted, which was evidence of criminality. Some of the other witnesses uh, may be a little more successful for the Republicans, but Lev Parnas was uh, not a success. So during his testimony, Parnas continued to say there was no evidence of corruption from the Biden family involving Ukraine. How much longer does it seem Republicans can try to push for an impeachment with such little evidence, especially when a key witness is charged with lying? Yeah, that's definitely a, uh, a solid political question there about how long they can do it. I mean, Republicans would do it for as long as they could until they uncover damaging information. And then, of course, remember, you say that Lev Parnas says, well, you know, there was no there was no support for the information that was provided. Lev Parnas provided some of that information. So he's essentially impeaching his own credibility. But look, when it comes to cooperators, what I've found uh, is that there you have situations where people were in the cult, you know, the figurative cult, so to speak, and they were brainwashed and they, they bought into it, and then now they see the light. And you know what? Uh, just as an, a, a comparison, juries believe that. They understand it. They get it. Uh, they're willing to forgive that somebody may have turned, changed sides and now sees the error of their ways. So uh, for that reason, I would say that ultimately the net effect of Parnas's uh, testimony was that he was credible and credible in a way that benefited the Democrats. So, Danny, Hunter Biden himself declined to testify, but now that two of his former business partners have testified in Congress, what's next here for Hunter? Boy, you know, Abby Lowell has kept us guessing, and that's Hunter Biden's attorney, who I think has done really a remarkable job, a creative job in playing defense attorney, because we defense attorneys are incredibly biased towards risk aversion. And Abby Lowell, you see him right there to the left of uh, Hunter Biden. We attorneys are always just to the left with half our face cut off. Uh, there he is again, half cut off. And, uh, you know, the lawyer, Hunter Biden's lawyer, Abby Lowell here, has really done a good job of protecting Hunter Biden, but also trying some creative ideas like offering him for uh, to possibly testify, then maybe not offering him to testify. What we've learned about uh, testimony in both the, in Congress is that it's not like an ordinary subpoena. You can use leverage uh, to testify, to not testify. Uh, you can make out arrangements. You can negotiate in a way you simply can't in the criminal justice system or even the civil system. So uh, this is, you know, this is all very strategic by Hunter Biden's team. And so far, they've done a pretty good job. All right, Danny Savalos, thank you so much. No, we show all of Danny's. I know. <laughs> Some <laughs> of the country will see <laughs> snow and rain today and the wet stuff's moving east for the weekend. Let's get a check on your morning news now weather. Angie Lastman is here in studio tracking it all. Hi, Angie, good morning. Hi, good morning, guys. We've got a whole lot to talk about over the next couple of days when it comes to impactful weather. Let's start with what we're dealing with right now. A little bit of snow working across parts of the northern plains and the upper Midwest. We've also got some snow working out of parts of New England, but more rounds of snow to come. And we've got plenty of winter alerts, 15 million people included in those here uh, through the next couple of days. This isn't just a today kind of a situation that we're going to be watching. We've got two sections that we're, we're keeping an eye on. One part of a system that's bringing the snow that you just saw to parts of the plains. That'll ramp up as the days go on. We've also got an area of low pressure that's going to kind of develop and then lift plenty of moisture into parts of the south. Today, it's stretching from Texas into Oklahoma and out towards the Gulf Coast. By tomorrow, much of this works into the southeast. We're talking drenching rain across portions of Florida and points north of that into the Carolinas. We've got some rain across parts of the Ohio Valley, and we've got some snow to deal with uh, across parts of the Great Lakes. As we get into your Saturday, unfortunately, it looks like we could see some soggy conditions for any outdoor plans you might have for Saturday up and down the East Coast and parts of the northern uh, New England area are going to see some really heavy and wet snow. We'll see some good amounts of snow at that, and notice how much uh, that heavy rain is kind of hugging the coastal areas. 
we're also going to watch for a potential for some of these stronger storms to develop. Not a whole lot of people included in this, but we've got uh, major cities like Houston that are going to see the potential for this later today. Looks like the biggest threat will be hail, but we could see maybe some gusty winds and even a couple of tornadoes through tonight. Uh, Rain-wise, I'm a little concerned about the flooding conditions across portions of South Florida. It doesn't take much for us to see uh, flooded streets there, impassable roads there. And we could see upwards of five to even six inches of rain in some of those isolated spots, especially south of Alligator Alley. You look along the Carolinas, heavy rain expected there, too, two to three inches by the time we get into the weekend. Again, with those isolated amounts, places like Atlantic City, New York, Boston, not out of the question for us to see up to four inches of rain. When it comes to the snow, parts of the upper Midwest, like the Dakotas, Montana, could see maybe six to nine inches. I think the more widespread numbers that you'll see, Minneapolis, Green Bay, parts of uh, Michigan and Illinois, maybe three inches or so. Uh, northern New England, though, uh, potentially a foot of snow by the time we get into Saturday. This will be something that we watch through Saturday. It'll start to wrap up by Sunday. Elsewhere for your Friday forecast, we've got plenty of sunshine middle of the country. It's unsettled. I just showed you across the east for the next couple of days. More sunshine for the middle of the country by the time we get into Saturday, but we'll start to see another system working into parts of the northwest and the, in the northern plains by the time Saturday rolls around. That starts to move a, a little farther to the east. The east, though, meanwhile, on Sunday, there's what you want for your forecast. At least you get one day of it. We've got some spring highs expected and uh, plenty of sunshine to kind of dry out after a very soggy Saturday. We'll take the one day. There My parents go. just arrived from San Diego for a rude awakening. <laughs> oh, I'm sure they're FYI, it feels like 17, guys, when I got up this morning. Hey, so we're that's welcome. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thanks, Angie. Of course. Well, attorneys for former President Trump have asked a judge to pause lawsuits in several civil cases seeking to hold the former president liable for damages related to the January 6th attack on the Capitol. This comes as the Supreme Court is set to hear oral arguments next month on Mr. Trump's claims of absolute immunity. He's accused of attempting to overturn the 2020 election results, which led to the events of January 6th. The high court's ruling will determine whether the election interference case brought by special counsel Jack Smith can move forward to trial. NBC's Garrett Haig joins us now from Washington with the latest developments. Garrett, good morning. So walk us through this motion filed by Trump's attorneys. What happens if his request for a stay is granted by the judge? Yeah, it's pretty straightforward here. What they're doing is essentially holding up this uh, oral arguments that they're going to have before the Supreme Court in late April as a shield against any other January 6 related cases, arguing that if the Supreme Court says Donald Trump is immune from criminal prosecution because of presidential immunity, that would change how their argument would play out in these civil cases. I'm not a lawyer. I sometimes play one on TV. But it seems like the kind of thing that a judge might look at at least as a, as a cause for delay here on cases that obviously were now several several years into anyway. So uh, we'll see what this judge in the civil case says. And of course, we'll be waiting probably till fairly late in the summer to hear what the Supreme Court's going to do on this immunity question. Mm -hmm. Garrett, let's go to Georgia, the election interference case there. The judge presiding over the case is giving Mr. Trump and eight of his co-defendants permission to appeal that order the judge made that allows D.A. Fonnie Willis to remain on the case. Of course, Nathan Wade had to resign from the case. What's the significance of this decision by the judge? How could it impact a case that's already moving pretty slowly. Well, the Trump uh, attorneys down in Georgia think it could be very significant. They still think there's a possibility on appeal that Falfani Willis could get thrown off this case, based at least in part on the scathing decision issued by the judge who allowed her to stay on it, but questioned her ethics and the way in which this trial would move forward. But even if they're not able to get her kicked off the case, this is once again an opportunity to delay that trial moving forward. And delay has been the order of the day for Donald Trump on all of these cases really since the jump. Garrett, I want to ask you about another piece of news from the former president. This was in a recent radio interview. Uh, he, former president seemed to suggest you would be open to supporting a national ban on abortion after 15 weeks of pregnancy. Tell us about what he said. Yeah, Savannah, during the course of his political career, Donald Trump has taken basically every conceivable position on the issue of abortion, and he's long resisted uh, as a Republican and as a Republican presidential candidate being pinned down on any kind of specific ban. In the past, he said this is the kind of thing that should be negotiated and that he would be well suited to negotiate it. But there's been a lot of discussion in his orbit about the idea of a 15 week national ban. Uh, the former president said he floated that number. He says he thinks there's a lot of agreement around that number. 
number. Uh, agreement among who, I think, is a fair question to ask there. Uh, but he does seem to be inching closer to taking a more concrete policy position on this, something that Democrats and the Biden campaign, by the way, are basically licking their chops about. They think this is a very potent issue for them and that any kind of national ban proposed by the Republican nominee here would be the kind of thing that would really rally uh, Democrats to President Biden's cause. All right, Garrett Haig, thank you so much. In a bid to fight man-made climate change, the White House announced new automobile standards aimed at cutting carbon emissions. The new rules relax tailpipe limits that were proposed last year. Eventually, the standards would get tougher over time to help reach the goals set out last year, like having more than 55 percent of car sales be electric by 2032. This new plan from the Biden administration comes as sales of electric vehicles are starting to slow down. The EPA says the new standards will prevent more than 7 billion tons of planet-warming carbon emissions over the next three decades. President Biden is looking to slash carbon dioxide emissions from gasoline-powered vehicles, which make up the largest single source of greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S. Well, guess what? It is finally time for March Madness. The college basketball tournament gets going today with matchups in the first round of the men's tournament. The good news, right now, your bracket is perfect. By day's end, it probably <laughs> won't be. No matter, the top teams in the nation are starting their journey toward a national championship. A six-game winning streak is all it takes to cut down those nets. Here to get us ready for the start of March Madness is USA Today national sports columnist Dan Wilkin. Dan, thanks for joining us. So first, just what are the top matchups that you're keeping an eye on? Well, you get that first round of the tournament. There's always those interesting 5-12, 6-11, where the upsets tend to be, even the 4-13 games. I've got my eye on a couple today, Gonzaga versus McNeese State. McNeese State, a team led by Will Wade, former LSU coach, was fired in a scandal. Goes down to McNeese State. He's got a team that's won 31 games this year. Interesting matchup for Gonzaga. Kansas is really injured right now. Uh, they're playing Samford, a team that really likes to get up and down the court. They press. They run. That's going to be fascinating. And then tomorrow, Texas A&M, Nebraska, great classic 8-9 game, very even teams. And then James Madison, really good team out of Virginia, 31-3 and this year, playing Wisconsin uh, from the Big Ten, who got to the final of the Big Ten tournament last week. So I think some really good first-round matchups coming. I put all 15 seeds. I'm just kidding. I did not do that at all. All right. So the madness has already begun even before the tournament started. Just a few years after winning the D1 title, Virginia already making an early exit, losing their play-in game. Tell us what we saw there. And what does this tell us about the intensity and the magic of March Madness? Well, yeah, if you even go back before Virginia won the national title, the year before that, if you remember, they were the first number one seed to ever lose to a number 16, UMBC. Terrible disappointment, historic loss. They come back the next year, win the title, play a bunch of close games. And ever since then, actually, Tony Bennett has not won a game in the NCAA tournament. College basketball, college sports have changed a lot since 2019 uh, with all the transfers, the name, image, and likeness, the ability to make money. Uh, doing ads and things like that. So, you know, Virginia is one of those programs that they really adapted quickly enough to this new world. Uh, their style of play, very slow and plotting. They don't score a lot of points. Uh, yeah, a little bit of a question mark right now about what the future is. Tony Bennett, great coach, had an unbelievable run at Virginia. But does he need to change some things to get that program back to the top of the sport? For anyone who is putting a last-minute bracket together, who do you see going far this year? Who, who should we put? Who's Elite Eight? Who's Final Four? What do you think? Well, I'll tell you what. Right now, I think UConn is the team that uh, has got to be favored to win back-to-back -back national titles. I mean, they've just been plowing through everybody. They've got the best offense in, in college basketball. Um, you know, Houston, on the other side of the bracket, they're the number one seed in the South. They've got the best defense out there and and they're just fantastic uh they make the game really ugly physical hard to score and then i, I think one of the big question marks here is purdue you know purdue zach Eady, national player of the year probably for a second year in a row you know, seven foot four uh incredible <laughs> height and uh proficiency around the basket but they lost last year in the first round as a number one seed uh, and so that's on their shoulders. How do they break through? They've had a couple March Madness disappointments. I think there's a ton of pressure on Purdue this year to cash in their last year with Zach Eady. Are they going to go all the way? Let's, of course, talk about the women's tournament, which begins tomorrow. Caitlin Clark in Iowa don't play until mm -hmm. Saturday. She has never won an NCAA title, but it's not going to be easy to do it again this year. What are you looking forward to most on the women's side? 
Yeah, obviously, Caitlin Clark, the season she's had, the career she's had, and drawing in casual fans to women's college basketball, really changing the face of the sport. I think the women's tournament is going to draw tremendous interest and in, in television viewers this year because of Caitlin Clark and some other storylines, including LSU. You know, LSU beat Iowa last year in the championship game, won it all under Kim Mulkey. Uh, it was a bit of a surprise run and and really made a star out of out of Angel Reese and uh, Flaje Johnson. So LSU is a really great team. And guess what? They're going to have to play Iowa potentially in the Elite Eight. Only one of those two teams is going to go to the Final Four this year. And then you've also got South Carolina, who is undefeated, trying to win a national championship. Don Staley, their coach, has won, won it twice, uh, has not gone undefeated, which they – Came up short last year. Iowa beat them in the Final Four. So if South Carolina can get there, if Iowa can get there, really, really intense, great just personalities and storylines in the women's draw. So exciting. Dan Mulkin, thank you so much. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.